we're going to be Mark chapter 2 for a little bit this morning. Uh, we're going to ask the question, now what? The evangelist has been here, he's preached his messages, he's hooked up to his trailer, and he's gone. Now what? What are we going to do now? You're stuck with me for, <laughs> for a while. Revival was good. I enjoyed it. I enjoyed the messages. I enjoyed the encouragement. I enjoyed uh, the help. Um, I think some folks got some help this week. I think it was good. I, if you missed it, you missed it. Uh, we couldn't put any in a baggie and and give you something to take with you. We couldn't stick it in a box. Uh, you can go back and watch it online or on our website, uh, which is which is live now, ebcwb, Ebenezer Baptist Church, West Virginia, dot org. Uh, you can check that out. Uh, but you, if you missed it, you missed it. Uh, let me ask you this. Why didn't everyone get help from Jesus when he was on earth? I think there's two reasons uh, that everyone uh, may not have got received help from Jesus. One is they just didn't come. They knew where Jesus was. They knew where he was going to be there. They knew what Jesus did when he showed up, but they didn't go. Or number two, they didn't do what he told them to do. Those, I believe, were the two reasons that would hinder folks from receiving help from Jesus. You can't get anything from a meeting or a service if you don't attend. And you can't get any results if you don't do what God tells you to do. Now that our revival was over, what's next? Now what? We look at Mark chapter 2, and we start in verse 1. It says, And again he entered into Capernaum after some days, and it was noise that he was in the house. And straightway many were gathered together, insomuch that there was no room to receive them. No, not so much as about the door. And he preached the word unto them. And they came unto him, bringing one sick of the palsy, which was born of four. And when they could not come nigh unto him for the press, they uncovered the roof where he was. And when they broke it up, they laid down the bed wherein the sick of the palsy lay. When Jesus saw their faith, he said unto the sick of the palsy, Son, thy sins be forgiven thee. But when there were certain of the scribes sitting there and reasoning in their hearts, Why does this man speak blasphemies? Who can forgive sins but God? Understand, they didn't say this audibly. It says they reasoned within their hearts. And Jesus, immediate, and immediately when Jesus perceived in his spirit that they so reasoned within themselves, he said unto them, Why reason ye these things in your heart? Jesus knew what they were thinking. You know what? He knows what you're thinking this morning. He knows what you're thinking all the time. He knows what you're upset about. He knows what you don't like. He knows what your true intentions are. He knows what you're after. He knows what you struggle with. We ask them, what the, why, uh, why reason these things in your heart? Verse 9. Whether it's easier to say to the sick of the palsy, thy sins be forgiven thee, or to say, arise and take up thy bed and walk. But that ye may know that the Son of Man hath power on earth to forgive sins. He saith to the sick of the palsy, I say unto thee, Arise, and take up thy bed, and go thy way into thy house. And immediately he rose up, and took the bed, and went forth before them all, insomuch that they were all amazed, and glorified God, saying, We never saw it on this fashion. Back up in verse 1, it says, uh, it says that when he went to Capernaum, after some days, it was noise that he was in the house. Folks were talking about it. Folks said, hey, Jesus is going to be here. Jesus is going to be there. Uh, and it drew a crowd. And we did something similar. We invited folks to revival. We sent flyers in the mail. Folks had cards to pass out. I don't know who passed out what. But you know. We set up extra chairs in the foyer. And Brother Vaughn said, man, you're, you're setting up seats before people ever show up. He said, that's faith. And I thought about it for a second. You know what? If we don't do something in faith, what do we do it for? 
I didn't know how many folks people were going to invite. Some would say that I look silly because I set up chairs and they didn't get used. I would say we had faith to set up chairs, but how many had faith to actually invite someone to come? Now, I don't know who invited folks. Only you know that. But if they can, if they come, the chairs are there, ready for them to hear what Jesus can do for them. Now, revival's over a uh, Wednesday night. Um, I, we, I got to talking. Some folks stayed after revival a little bit. We were talking a little bit. And uh, they said, well, what, is, what do you want us to tear these chairs down? And I said, I don't think we're going to tear them down. Hey, listen, those flyers, just because someone didn't come Monday through Wednesday doesn't mean they're not here today. Doesn't mean they're not going to come next Sunday. Hey, I, I believe we should have the uh, faith to leave the chairs in the foyer. Uh, if somebody may come and say, hey, um, I'm just not comfortable yet. There's a place in the back they can sit. They can hear. They can see. They can still uh, hear God's word being preached and not have to sit near folks that uh, they may not necessarily know have been around. I think it's a good idea to leave the chairs up. But really, I want to leave them up because I want to see them full. I want to see the sanctuary full. I want to see the, the four-year full. I want to see us happen to have a business meeting to figure out what are we going to do? Are we going to have two services? Are we going to have to make some more seating space somewhere? What are we going to do? You know what? That's a good problem to have. They had that problem here. There were so many people, nobody else could come. But that didn't stop these folks from bringing their friend. They brought him. Uh, he got to see Jesus. They tore the roof off. They let him down. You know the story. I, and I'm not necessarily talking about the story this morning, but what I want to know, what did the man do that was healed? He got help from Jesus. What did he do next? Did he get back in his bed? Did he just lay there? Did he say, thank you, Jesus, for helping me and just sit? He didn't. Uh, he was, was he the same or was he different? The Bible tells us he immediately got up and did what God asked him to do. Jesus said, take up thy bed and walk. That's exactly what he did. Hey, listen, uh, Brother Vaughn gave us some very good uh, scriptural advice this past week. He said, here's some things you need to do. What did we do with them? Now, these are things you can only answer to yourself personally. Hey, but I believe there's nothing to do any good to look into a mirror and not realize, hey, did I make the changes that I needed to make? You know, the Bible calls itself a mirror. Well, uh, what kind of man, it says, and I'm paraphrasing here because I don't know the verse from heart, but it says, what kind of man looks in a mirror, sees something wrong and doesn't fix it and leaves the same way he came? But you know what? Oftentimes we do that every single Sunday. We read the Bible, uh, a preacher preaches to us, a speaker speaks, a Sunday school teacher, somebody challenges us or gives us a thought to provoke us to think and say, Man, I never considered that before. I need to do something with that. And by the time we get to our car or our truck, we forgot. We didn't do it. Hey, sometimes you say, why do you, why do you get on uh, coming to the altar so often? Because you know what? That gives you a point of reference in your mind to think back to. I remember when I decided this. It was important enough for me to get out of my seat, uh, to be uncomfortable, to walk to the front of the room, and, and, and make a commitment to God. I'm going to remember that. Hey, some things, I made some commitments in my mind. There were some things even I thought I was going to say this morning, and I didn't write them down, or I didn't do anything to help me remember, and they're gone. I forgot. Unless God brings them back to my memory, <laughs> you're not going to get to hear them. I don't remember. So when you hear a message, when someone uh, 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 preaches or... or or teaches a lesson and, and God speaks to you specifically about a specific thing, it's time to do business. That's why we have a time of invitation. Do you think the room is full of people that are unsaved? Now catch this. Maybe. I don't know your heart. But God does. He knows it inside and out. He knows all the secret places. He knows all the little closets. He knows what you think nobody else knows. Now get this. He loves you anyway. He wants to do something through you anyway.
But God knows. And when he speaks to us, he'll tell us, hey, you, you need to stop this. Or you need to start this. Or you need to adjust this. And when invitation time comes, that's your time to respond to how God spoke to you during the message. Some folks barely don't even understand what an altar calls for. Hey, well, uh, there's only five of us here and all of us are saved. We're not going to have an altar call. Hey, listen, if you don't have come to a decision point, uh, every time you go into church, something's wrong. Why? Why would you not have a, why would God not speak to me every service? Well, one reason might be, I didn't ask him to. You have to prepare your heart for worship. And part of that is saying, God, what do you want me to learn today? What is it you have for me today? Tell me something. It's amazing how one message can speak to a room full of people in the way or the area in which they need spoken to. Now understand, one message should not tell five people five completely opposite different things. That's not what I'm saying here. But uh, somebody may get something out of one point and another point and another point and when, when God orchestrates a message... It's so that everyone in the room can get something from it. You say, I'm just not getting anything. I don't understand this. Maybe you didn't ask. And the other reason could be, the Bible says that spiritual things are foolishness to folks that aren't saved. Now, when I say foolishness, I don't necessarily mean silly, but they don't understand. They don't understand what God's trying to tell them because they've never truly been saved. Now, Wednesday night... Uh, Brother Vaughn preached probably one of the best messages I've ever heard on salvation. How to be saved. Why we need to be saved. Uh, what's going to happen if we don't get saved. Very, very good message. But knowing that information isn't going to help us. We have to do something with it. The message is supposed to bring us to a decision-making point. In our life. This man's interaction with Jesus brought him to a decision in his life. Hey, listen, he'd never walked before. Do we, can we understand that this morning? Could you imagine? The Bible doesn't tell us how old he is, uh, but he wasn't a child. He was big enough that he called his friends, the folks that I would think would be his peers, were big enough to pick him up and carry him and tear off a roof and have the mental capacity to figure all this out and lower him down to Jesus. I'd say they were at least young men. I don't think they were kids here or teenagers. They were at least young men, if not middle-aged men, trying to get their friend to Jesus. He had been at least 20, 30, 40, I don't know, years and had never walked. And Jesus said... Take your bed and walk. Do you think he would have thought, I don't know how. What, what if I can't? What if I stand up and I fall? Are these not the questions we ask ourselves when God says, I want you to do this? Or, go do this. I can't do that. I'm nervous. I'm afraid. What's people going to think? Could you imagine what, if that fellow would have sat there for five minutes thinking, man, if I go to get up and I fall, it, it's going to be embarrassing. What's people going to think? How, how am I going to do this? There's nowhere for me to walk. What, and he did, he, what did he do? He took up his bed and he walked. Hey, if God speaks to you in a service and says, I want you to deal with me about this, when the invitation starts, get up and walk. That's where it starts. That's where it starts, is being, being ready to make a decision for God. I don't know what it is. Hey, listen, do you have the faith and the courage to say to God before a sermon, you don't know what the message is going to be about, you don't know what the preacher is going to be about, but would you tell God, hey, whatever you tell me, I'm going to do it immediately. Most of us are going to say, I want to figure it out first. I want to see if I can do it. I want to see if it's comfortable. I want to see if I know how. I want to see if it's not too much. Hey, listen, we need to be at the point where we'll give God everything. It don't matter what it is. If he asks for it, he can have it. And listen, understand God's not this, this uh, broker sitting at a table trying to cut deals. Hey, if you, uh, if you do this for me, then uh, he just he expects our obedience. That's it. He expects us to obey him. He paid the ultimate sacrifice. He left heaven. He came to earth. He lived a sinless life. He was beaten. He was 
uh, cursed at. He had his beard plucked out. He had a, corn, uh, a crown of thorns driven on his head. He was nailed to a cross. He was stabbed in the side with a spear. He was dead three days. And he rose again for you. Yes. For me. What could he ask me to do that's too much for what he did for me? Nothing. Nothing. Hey, listen, when I was flying across the country, when I was uh, sitting in the middle of, of conference rooms, uh, figuring out how this takedown was going to go and keeping track of it on a computer uh, while the cops went and rusted down doors and arrested drug dealers and pedophiles and, and wicked people to put them in jail. While I was uh, playing around afterwards, uh, I got to go to uh, with the uh, Norfolk, Virginia Fire Department bomb squad one time. I went down and trained them, showed them how to use our site, uh, showed them what the information they needed, did my job. At the end of the day, they said, hey, listen, it's the time of the month where we have to go blow some stuff up. Do you want to go? <laughs> yeah, I want to go. <laughs> I, I, I got to go watch. It was incredible. You know, they had to, uh, somebody would have to have some type of suspicious package and they would have to check it out and, and, and tell what they would do. Uh, and then they would have to detonate, practice detonating things. I got to watch all these things. Hey, listen, when God said, I don't, that's not for you anymore. I want you to stand in front of people. The most in, uncomfortable thing, one of the most uncomfortable things for you to do, that's what I want you to do from now on. But it's not the police officers, it's the souls to tell them uh, that I love them and that I died for them and they're going to go to hell without me. That's what I want you to tell them. That's what I want you to do from now on. And by the way, you don't get a check from the government no more. Now listen, I thank the church for taking care of me very well. I appreciate that. But I didn't take the job for the money. I took the job because God said, this is what I want you to do from now on. I didn't do anything. God did it all. God did it. God allowed me to sit under godly preaching that challenged me. God allowed me to bring me, uh, to, God brought me to a point and a decision in my life where I had to decide, what am I going to do? What's next? Hey, listen, there's not always going to be an evangelist here to feed us. Messages aren't always going to be uh, uh, five star, especially if I'm up here. There's some times we're going to have to find some things out for ourselves. There's some times we're going to have to be willing to go through some hard parts. But God will go with us if we do what we ask him to do. He immediately got up and did what God asked him to do. I understand being cautious. I understand uh, being smart about what God gave us. But if God calls us to do something, we shouldn't still be having meetings about it three years later, deciding if that's what we're going to do. God says do it, and we hear him tell us we need to do it. Now if we look over in the book of Luke chapter 18, and if we start in verse 18, it says, And a certain ruler asked him, saying, Good master, what shall I do to inherit eternal life? And Jesus said unto him, Why callest thou me good? None is good save one, and that is God. Thou knowest the commandments. Do not commit adultery. Do not kill. Do not steal. Do not bear false witness. Honor thy father and thy mother. And he said, All these things have thy kept from my youth up. Now when Jesus heard these things, he said unto him, Yet lackest thou one thing. Sell all that thou hast, and distribute unto the poor, and thou shalt have treasure in heaven, and come, follow me. And when he heard this, he was very sorrowful, for he was very rich. And when Jesus saw that he was sorrowful, he said, How hardly shall they that receive riches enter into the kingdom of God? For it's easier for a camel to go through a needle's eye than for a rich man to enter into the kingdom of God. Why didn't the rich ruler get any help from Jesus? Exactly right. That's exactly right. Uh, he didn't do what he was told to do. Do you think the rich young, rich young ruler was serious when he asked Jesus about eternal life? I think he probably was. He said, hey, what do I got to do? I'm interested in this. This sounds good to me. Hey, listen, when you tell someone what heaven's going to be like, and you tell someone what hell's going to be like, heaven sounds pretty good, doesn't it? Who wants to go burn in a fire? 
Who wants to be in darkness? Who wants to be where there's wailing and gnashing of the teeth? Who wants to be where the worm dieth not? Who wants to spend eternity in torment? Nobody. Rich young ruler said, hey, I'm, yeah, I'm interested. What do I got to do to have eternal life? And Jesus knew exactly how he needed to talk to him. He knew exactly what he needed to say. He brought the rich young ruler to a decision point in his life. He said, sell all you have and follow me. Now let me ask you this. If the rich young ruler or you sell everything you have and um, attempt to follow Jesus, will you end up in heaven? Now, technically, that answer is yes, because following Jesus would be getting saved. But a lot of people think, if I just do good, if I just follow these uh, uh, the Ten Commandments the best I can, and I try to be nice to my neighbors, and I try not to say bad words, and I try not to drink alcohol, and I try not to smoke cigarettes, and I don't run around on my wife, and I don't cheat at work, and I pay my taxes, all of them, then I should get to go to heaven someday. It's not the way it works. Jesus knew what his love was. What would Jesus have to tell you to sell or quit or give away and follow him to get you to think like this rich young ruler did? Is it really worth it? I I'm really attached to this item, this thing, whatever it is, my pride, what people's going to think of me. You know, that's all, uh, that's all, when you worry about what other people think of you, that's pride is, is, is the root of that. Uh, when you worry about uh, what your neighbor's going to say, when you worry about being embarrassed, when you worry about uh, others when it comes to things of the cause of Christ, it's pride that says, no, don't do that. You're going to be embarrassed. Don't do that. Somebody's going to make fun of you. Don't do that. That's going to look strange. It's pride that, that does that to us. It's not always uh, money or a car or a job or something that keeps us from doing God's will. Oftentimes, a lot of times, it's pride that keeps us from it. He didn't do what he was told. His priorities were not right. He was too rich. What's our excuse? Are we too busy? Do we have too much to do? Are there other things that are more important? We worry about others. What will we do with what we learned during revival? Let me ask. Revival ended in today on Thursday. Did we go back to the old? Did we get back in our bed, figuratively speaking, like the man that couldn't walk? Did we get back in our bed, uh, uh, what, was, what was holding us? Are we the same Sunday morning as we were last Sunday? Well, I guess the Sunday before last, before revival. Hey, what do we do with it? What do we do with what God tells us to do? Maybe some of us uh, came to revival, maybe even came every night, and God spoke to us, and we knew that there was something that God wanted us to do. We knew there was something we needed to take care of, and we didn't. Can I tell you this? It's not too late. As long as you're still breathing, it's not too late to make decisions that God's asked you to make. Hey, listen, how many days or how long did it take Jonah to decide to follow what God told him to do? Did Jonah go immediately? He didn't. Hey, listen, Jonah had to face a huge consequence because he didn't obey immediately. But because he didn't obey immediately, was it too late for Jonah? No, it didn't have to be. God brought a storm, God sent a fish. Uh, three days later, Jonah decides, hey, I'm ready to do what God tells me to do. Now, what does God have us to do, do to us to bring us to that decision? He gives us the opportunity in a nice, heated, air-conditioned, depending on what time of year it is, room, nice padded seats, comfortable, and a room full of people that will encourage you, whatever decision that may be. We can make our decisions there, or we can run, like Jonah did. It's a scary thing to find yourself in the hands of an angry God. I doesn't like when we don't listen. He doesn't like, and honestly, here's, here's, here's one of the reasons why. How many times has God proven himself to you? For me, it's time and time and time and time again. 
He's proved himself to me over and over again. And when I say I can't do that, I'm saying God doesn't have the power to work through me. God doesn't have the power to help me. God doesn't have the power to do what he's asked me to do. Wouldn't that be offensive to you? It's offensive to God. When we say I can't, we're telling God he's not big enough. He's not strong enough. He didn't make the right decision. Surely he messed up. God's perfect. He doesn't mess up. He doesn't mess up. So it's not too late if God has you uh, had you considering something or trying to make a decision. And that most important decision we can make this morning is, what have you done with the person, Jesus Christ? And you say, what do you mean? Well, several of the messages, uh, at least parts of them anyway, talked about salvation. Now, we can all pretend that every preacher just preaches salvation because he doesn't know how to preach anything else. I think Brother Vaughn showed us he has quite a knowledge about all kinds of things. But for some reason, he touched on salvation multiple times. God gave somebody multiple chances to make a decision for him. I can only, the only thing that makes sense in my mind, if the Bible be true and God be real, and this thing is, is the way God says it is, the only reason that would happen is because somebody in the room needed to hear it. Somebody was at revival that wasn't saved. And maybe multiple somebodies. Hey, listen, if you're trusted in uh, 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 the, the religious ceremonies you went through in a, while you went to another church and to getting you to heaven, you're not on your way to heaven. There's no religious ceremony you can go through that will pay for your sin. Zero. If you're trusting on a baptism you had or a sprinkling or whatever you want to call it uh, when you were a child and because that happened, you're going to heaven, you're not going to heaven. It's not the way it works. If you're trusting on uh, grandma telling you you was always a good kid and uh, when you were four, you got on your knees and asked Jesus to save you and you don't remember it. And you never lived any different and you've lived your life in sin. You're not going to heaven. It's not in you. Jesus says, I am the way, the truth, and the life, and no man comes to the Father but by me. If you've never put your faith and trust in Jesus Christ, the man, the God, you're not on your way to heaven. The Bible's clear. Let me ask you this morning, what are you putting your faith and trust in? Hey, I, I, I give my tithe, I give 50% of what I make to the church, I'm going to get you heaven. Hey, I'm here at every work day, even picking up garbage, going down the road. I'm not going to get you to heaven. Works can't get you there. He was very clear. I like how he said, works do not get you to heaven. But when you're saved, you do works. That, 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 that's key right there. That's a clue for us. Here's some temperature, uh, temperature gauges we can check in our life uh, to show our spiritual condition. I mean, you should know where you were. When you got saved. Now there are people that will say. You should know the date. You should know the time. You should know what verses was used. You should know what the preacher said. You should know what tie he was wearing. I'm not that guy. But I'll tell you this. When something as big as salvation happened. You ought to remember. You ought to know where you were. I can't tell you the preacher's name. I can tell you the name of the church. It was a, a, a small non-denominational church. Uh, in Chester, West Virginia. Where I grew up. I was seven or eight years old maybe. I can tell you everything that happened that day. Just like it was yesterday. I can't tell you what day it was. But I remember it. Because I was there. No one had to remind me. I'm not remembering a story somebody told me. I remember when it happened. I remember living in sin in school. I do. Can a Christian live in sin? I believe they can. They're not going to be happy. God chastised me almost daily. I was miserable as a teenager because I was trying to be cool and fit in and I was trying to be a Christian and can I tell you this you can't do that you can't you cannot sin comfortably if you're saved if you can you're not saved that's a good gauge to check um, how about this what's your attitude you say wait a minute what do you mean what's my attitude how do you handle conflict Hey, if conflict flies you off the handle, God, Jesus died on the cross giving you the power to say no to sin, and that, that includes our hateful attitudes. 
You say, man, that's not easy. It's not easy. The power's there. We just have to ask for it. And if we never can get victory over that, there might be a reason we might not be saved. Hey, let me ask you this. And this one, this one I, I covered for a long, long time. Because uh, it wasn't anybody's business how I sang. I didn't have to sing. You understand that because of what Jesus did for you, you are on your way to heaven for eternity. What else could make us want to sing? I didn't have any problem turning on the radio, singing whatever was on the radio, looking like a fool going down to, in, my, in my car, rolling the window down and everybody else rolls theirs up. That didn't bother me none. Why wouldn't I sing in church? Because that's the thing that my heart wanted. How do we sing? Hey, I have noticed uh, through the revival, even this morning, man, singing was good. Yeah, folks were singing loud. Folks were singing to the Lord. And you know what? That makes him happy. That makes God happy. So I ask you this morning, what have you done with the person of Jesus Christ? Hey, if you're not saved, don't wait. Don't wait. Hey, if you're not sure, you might say, man, I've been in church 50 years, but... I'm still not sure. It's okay. You still have time to figure it out. Just do it now. None of us are promised tomorrow. I would venture to say there are folks, maybe even folks we know, that had plans today that never got to do them because last night was their last night alive. How many times have you gotten a phone call? Hey, this person or that person suddenly passed away. Accident. Something happened. Something bad. And it's just, it's over. Hey, listen, that's when it's too late. That's when it's too late. We can't uh, die, wake up in eternity and say, oh, by the way, I meant to get saved before I died. It's too late. It doesn't work that way. Now's the time. That's why the Bible says today is the day of salvation. Not tomorrow, today. Hey, if you're not saved this morning, as the piano player comes and the song leader comes, if you're not saved this morning, how about let's make today the day 